Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. My name is Blanche. I use she and her pronouns and I am the events and public programming coordinator here at the library company. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to Professor Van Goss for joining us this evening. We are so excited to hear about your 2021 book, The First Reconstruction, Black Politics in America from the Revolution to the Civil War. A few short housekeeping items. Closed captioning is available for tonight's event. I will be posting instructions on how to turn on and off closed captioning in the chat, as well as providing some, you know, links and additional information in the chat throughout the event. If this is your first library company event, I'd like to extend an extra welcome. If you are not familiar, the Library Company of Philadelphia was founded in 1731, and we are an independent research library concentrating on American society and culture from the 17th through the 19th centuries. We house an extensive non-circulating collection of rare books, manuscripts, broadsides, ephemera, prints, photographs, and works of art, and a few objects, I will just say. Um, we are free and open to the public. If you are local to Philadelphia, I encourage you all to come by between the hours of nine to five, Monday through Friday, and check out our exhibitions. And no matter where you live, you can become a member at the library company and support free programs like this one. You can even hold one of our original shares. I'll be posting a link in the chat where you can learn more about becoming a shareholder. So the Fireside Chat series, the event series you are um, joining us tonight for, began in 2020 when the library was physically closed due to COVID-19. But the Fireside Chats have continued even as we have reopened our doors as a virtual programming series where we get to share, where we get to share exciting new research um, with a wide public audience. We have more than 70 past programs available for free on our website and our YouTube channel. And we will be recording um, tonight's event as well. So if you miss anything or if you're like, wow, that was amazing. I really wanna send this to a friend or colleague or family member. We will be sending you that link. You can do so. Um, our next fireside chat is March 17th and that will be the Cacophony of Politics with Matt Gallman. So you will, um, you can sign up for that as well if you're interested. And another important piece of information for tonight's chat before I introduce our speaker, um, you can ask questions throughout the presentation and during the Q&A using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screens. And you can also post questions as well as comments, exclamations um, in the chat box. So without further ado, I am excited to introduce Professor Van Goss. Van Goss is a professor of history at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Lancaster. I was just corrected of my pronunciation, so I'm, I'm working on that, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He's the author of numerous articles and books on post-1945 politics and social movements, including Where the Boys Are, Cuba, Cold War America, and the Making of a New Left. More recently, he has written on African-American politics in the antebellum era, what we are all here to learn more about tonight. He's also co-chair of Historians for Peace and Democracy. So thank you, Professor Goss, some virtual applause. I turn it over to you. You are muted, I will say. Well, it's a great privilege to be here. Thank you, Blanche, and thank you to the library company. Um, a most distinguished institution that I'm uh, honored to be part of for this moment. So um, I'm going to start off by just giving you a little idea of the import of my book or what, the, what I hope is the import of my book. So first you will note it's big, it's a doorstop. There is a reason for that, which is that I'm making so many claims that have been 
you know, for ignored that I feel I have need to have all the evidence right out in front. Um, what one very favorable reviewer, the great historian, Sean Wilentz said, my immense detail. Okay, so here's this big book. Here's the cover, the first reconstruction. What's on the cover is a newspaper story that came out the day of the most important election in American history. There shouldn't be any confusion about what is the most important election in American history. It's November 6th, 1860. It's the election that Abraham Lincoln wins with 39.8% of the popular vote, but he carries the North outside of New Jersey. It immediately precipitates the worst war in our history, a war of liberation and revolution. So it is the most important election. I have no doubt about that. Um, so um, this, what I printed on here, is a story that came out in the New York Herald on election day. The New York Herald circulation has been estimated at about maybe 1.4 million, I believe. Um, there is no newspaper today remotely comparable in terms of its reach. It is a rapidly, by our standards, a rapidly racist, extremely partisan Democratic newspaper that is spreads all over the country, the New York Herald, extremely influential. It is the Democratic paper. So here's the story that's on election day, 1860. Lincoln is sure to be defeated. The Supreme Court has decided in the Dred Scott case that Negroes are not citizen of the, citizens of the United States. The Senate and the House of Representatives in Congress are both anti-Lincoln. And when they open the electoral returns, gosh, think of that, and count the votes, um, they will, of course, throw out the 14,000 Negro votes in Ohio, which gives the state to the Democrats, and so on. So this vitally important Democratic newspaper huge readership is talking about the 14,000 Negro votes in Ohio and how they could be thrown out. Hmm. So that's the thrust of my book is that black votes mattered a lot. So um, I want to, I will be talking about historiography, the history of history, because it is by no means a strictly academic issue. What gets left in and taken out. Um, you know, this, this is intensely serious and political. Uh, today, I showed my students in my African-American history class a leading textbook published in the later 1960s um, that had no mention of Black people at all between the end of Reconstruction and 1877. This is two Columbia University professors. One of them was still there when I was at Columbia in the early 80s. Not a single mention of African Americans from the end of Reconstruction until suddenly the March on Washington. Not one. Not a mention of lynching or segregation or Jim Crow. Not a one in this very important textbook, a leading textbook. So what we leave in and what we take out really matters. And of course, right now we see enormous attempts all over the country to decide what will be left in and taken out, taught to our K-12 students. So I want to talk about now the great fallacy that um, especially among progressive and educated and liberal Americans, uh, a huge fallacy about the nature of voting in America. Um, here's a typical, it was December 14th, 2020 email from a big voting rights group called Stand Up America. I got this email, it was fundraising, of course, and it said, it asserted that at the Republic's founding, and I quote, only white men who owned property were guaranteed the right to vote. Some version of the statement is a received truth, especially in the liberal press. It undergirds a hopeful attitude toward America's history, similar to President Obama's famous evocation, very moving at his 200, 2013 inaugural, of the upward path, the progress upwards, Seneca Falls, Selma, and Stonewall. Except this is a fallacy. It is a myth in every respect, and we need to blow away this myth so that we understand the fragility of American democracy at every point, including in the present. No part of that statement is accurate, that only white men who own property were guaranteed to write the vote. Let's start with men. In one of the original 13 states, New Jersey, right next to you there in Philly, by no means the smallest of the original 13, women voted legally, openly, were courted as voters from 1776 to 1807. This is not an accident or an anomaly. Sometimes even black women voted, 
The prerequisite is that they not be under the couverture, the legal cover of a husband or father. They be widowed or single. So women did vote. This wasn't something impossible to imagine. Now we get to the big one because the core of this um, mistaken liberal history is that there were property requirements everywhere and they were relaxed. No, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, other states at the get-go had only tax paying requirements were extremely minimal. I'm actually going to quote the man that I think of as perhaps the greatest revolutionary in American history, Thaddeus Stevens of Lancaster, our congressman, the radical Republican. At the 1837-38 Constitutional Convention in Pennsylvania that, that disfranchised Pennsylvania's Black electorate, he wanted to keep the minimal tax paying requirement. Um, and he said, and I quote him, and anyone who knows anything about Tad Stevens know what a bruiser he was. It is well known that any man who chose to be assessed could compel the assessor to tax him if he has any taxable property, meaning a few tools, or any occupation. If he labored one day in the week and begged all the rest of the time, he could compel the assessor to return him as a voter. This is what was called the pauper exclusion. So let's get rid of this idea that at the founding, everyone, you had to have property to vote. So now we get down to it that it was white men only who could vote. This is really pernicious. And it was well known before the Civil War that that had not been true. The principal exclusion of voting prior to the revolution in British America was religious, Catholics and Jews. Depending on which colony you're in, sometimes both, sometimes one or the other. Generally, England was a Protestant, a Protestant people for a Protestant country, and that was the rule. Pennsylvania welcomed all these German-speaking Protestants, and they could vote. But Catholics, no. I don't know. I'm not talking about Pennsylvania specifically. So, um, so let's flash forward. And this is one of my little... It's 1857. We're in Springfield, Illinois, and a prominent lawyer gets up to denounce the Dred Scott decision. Now, if I say prominent lawyer in Springfield, Illinois in 1857, you know who I'm talking about. And he was a very, very good lawyer. And he knew what a terrible, like utterly no precedent, no basis in law Dred Scott was. It's premise that Africa, people of African descent had never been citizens. So Abraham Lincoln gets up and he quotes Justice Benjamin Curtis's minority descent, which specified, and Lincoln quotes it, that in five of the original 13 states, black men had voted to ratify the constitution. The quotation actually was, free Negroes, Negroes were voters and proportion to their numbers had the same part in making the constitution that the white people had, except Lincoln and Beg Justice Curtis didn't have access to online, every state constitutional convention, all the laws, they were, you know, what law library they could find. It wasn't five of the 13, it was 10 of the 13. Only Georgia, South Carolina, and Virginia had a racial suffrage at the founding. And indeed, when South Carolina tried to put white in as a qualifier for citizenship in 1778 in the Congress, in the Articles of Confederation, which is the, the document that certifies who's a citizen prior to the Constitution, um, Carolina, South Carolina was overwhelmingly rebuffed. No one wanted to put white in there. And the Constitution was completely silent on what qualifies a citizen, it was left up to the states. So um, the premise of my book, having dispensed with this myth, this fallacy, and I hope none of you ever believe it again when you read it, you will read it again. Some pundit somewhere, someone on Rachel will say it, it's not true. The premise of my book is that black men voted and engaged in party and partisan politics often in many places um, even some Southern states until the 1830s, free black men did engaged in partisan politics. At every point, they were doing this between 1790 and 1860, and that furthermore, that it mattered. It wasn't a minor little obscure fact. Why did it matter? Well, sometimes, depending on where you were, and we're going to talk about one quite famous instance in Pennsylvania, but in quite a few other places, um, they, they were enough votes to swing an election. If you believe as we all do, that a small number of votes moved or blocked can swing an election. Political scientists don't like that conception because they say it's an individual choice. But the perception was is that the black vote was enough. If it was cast as a block, as it usually was, they were very partisan. Um, so that's one thing. They, they actually swung elections, and this was often brought up. 
in state legislative elections and congressional elections. And as I cited, the Democrats tried to claim they were going to swing Ohio in 1860, Ohio then being the third largest state in the union. Um, here's the second reason why it mattered. Slaveholders and slaveholders allies, which is to say the Democratic Party of that time, hated this fact. They talked about it endlessly, about the Negro voters, and they used other words there. They, they, it obsessed them. Uh, much of my evidence comes from their vituperative newspaper coverage of Black voting. They paid great attention because it was a rebuff to the premise that, of what they were trying to create, which was a white republic. And I think that it matters because it changes how we see the past, literally. Whom is in your mind's eye approaching the poll, paper in hand? Because that's how you voted then. You had a paper, a party worker handed it to you, the Whig ticket, the Republican ticket, the Democratic ticket, whatever, Federalist ticket, so on. You went to the poll and you handed it in. It was very much more visible than it is now. Who do you see in Bucks County in 1837, in Syracuse, New York in 1858, in Cleveland in 1849, in New Bedford in 1833, or near where I live, one block from where I live. It was a black political clubhouse in 1813 with banners outside mobilizing voters. So I, my book, my, the story I'm telling, asks you to rethink who you imagine voting in America before the Civil War and what it means if you can, in fact, as I insist you can, see black men approaching the polls alongside white men. Um, so why has it been almost completely ignored? Um, my, my insight is that both the two major groups of historians in the past 30, 40 years, since we actually began to do black history instead of whiting it out, there's sort of what I would call the liberals, the traditional liberal historians, which is Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Some of you've heard of him his age of Jackson, enormously influential. And then the person who has sort of picked up that banner, Sean Wilentz at Princeton, um, much more conscious of race and slavery, but I would say a liberal historian, and I hope he would not mind that. And the radical historians, people like David Rodiger in The Wages of Whiteness or Alexander Saxton in The Rise and Fall of the White Republic and so on. Both the radicals and the liberals both of them agreed that black voting just didn't happen or didn't happen anywhere near enough for anyone to pay attention because it, it conflicted with their understanding of what was going on, even though they otherwise disagreed. So I'm, I'm kind of challenging both of them. So I do believe there was something that we can call a white republic. I mean, I think it was very strongly, it's the essence of the Democratic Party of Andrew Jackson is that literally expresses their politics, drive out and kill Indians, build slavery and suppress the rights of black people. Um, but my argument is that the white Republic is not a single fact, a totality, just the way it is. It's a political project. It's a program that is fought over for decades really from the 1790s that is challenged by others. And I've mentioned Andrew Jackson. Jefferson is fundamentally advocating a white republic and he's more sneaky than Jackson, but it is fought by federalists, some Northern federalists, not all. It is absolutely fought by Th Tad Stevens, by William Seward, by Salmon P. Chase, by significant political leaders throughout this period. And you know, the sort of heroic figure here is Congressman John Quincy Adams in the 1830s and 40s. He fights the white republic, not simply slavery, but the notion that this is a white man's country. So um, quickly, I will note, it's not that historians have completely ignored black voting, but almost all of the attention with a few great honorable exceptions has been on disfranchisement. There is plenty of history about the disfranchisement of black voters, um, including in Pennsylvania, New York, various places, but hardly only a few other historians of whom, upon, upon whom I rely have said, well, why were they disfranchised? That means they were voting before, and where were they not disfranchised? And my strong sense is that 
well, first, that we should not accept disfranchisement as just natural, just the way things were, because it was, in fact, fought over really, really hard. My core argument is that Black men were disfranchised not because they were Black, but because it was convenient. It was straight up power politics. There's a group, you can stigmatize them, you can find a basis for driving them out of the body politic. It is ruthless and amoral and brutal. And I don't want anyone to have any doubts about, I see exactly the same thing happening now. But it is not driven by deep racial feeling. It is, a, it is unprincipled, it is opportunistic. And the reason I stress that is because it took so long for various groups of white men, political active, operative, operatives to get around to it. At a certain point, it suddenly occurred to them. Black men, I'm gonna share my screen, were voting all over large parts of Pennsylvania for decades and decades. And suddenly the Democrats up their backs up against the wall decided, aha, wait a minute, we could drive them out. That'll, that'll cut the margins of our opponents sharply. So let's, let's do it now. And it'll help us whip up certain groups, especially the Irish. So I think that what we're the period we're living through now should you know, help clarify what I mean about naked, brutal power politics that uses race and ethnicity to, you know, to get power. Um, huh. I'm sure everyone gets my point. So I will move on. Now, my book, I, I have, and I would be happy to send anyone who wants to email me. You can put my email in the chat. Uh, you know, the, the short list of books that I rely upon, it's not very long, but there's some really good books and some articles. But my book is, my book is mostly case studies almost not exactly book length, but large ones about New England, New York, what I call the New York battleground, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. That is not exhaust the history of black voting by any means. And I have other articles that talk about it. Black men were voting visibly in Tennessee and North Carolina until the mid 1830s. And then, you know, a re it came along the idea of driving them out, polarizing the white electorate. But these are the places that I focus on. Um, I do begin the book with one chapter on what I call the ideology of Black Republicanism before the Civil War. I'm sure some of the historians in this audience know that I'm obviously gesturing towards Eric Foner's extraordinarily influential book, Free Labor, Free Soil, Free Men, The Ideology of the Republican Party Before the Civil War. So I claim there was a vernacular Black Republicanism sort of discourse that black men and their allies used all over the country to assert their citizenship. Um, the English, the bedrock English notion, notion of birthright, they were born on the soil. Um, black men just said that all the time, especially once the immigrants, the Irish and the Germans started coming in, they really said it then. Um, Orthodox Protestantism, and often this is stated in a way that is not obvious when, when a black speaker, Douglas would say this, said it all the time, we worship, we read the same Bible as you. What they meant is we're Orthodox Protestants, which is true. They were Methodists and Baptists, like the majority of white people. A military service, that was an important um, claim. And here they got this sort of wonderful backdoor endorsement from Andrew Jackson, his famous letters to his black troops after the victory at New Orleans in 1815, where he held them as fellow citizens. They used that a lot. And finally, a kind of, if I say this, it's probably gonna sound strange, a kind of principled nativism. They did not indulge in the vicious, to me, essentially racist baiting of Catholics, especially the Irish, but they did unequivocally assert um, that they were better Americans. For one thing, they didn't riot. They didn't mob people. They behaved the way Americans were supposed to. So they were in a certain sense nativist. So um, from having sort of established this black republicanism, how they claim citizenship, um, at the beginning of the book, I then proceed via these case studies to three different versions of black politics um, where they were never disfranchised they always voted openly and unequivocally. There was never any effort, which is in what I call Upper New England. That's Massachusetts and points north, um, A. B, where they had long voted, but lost the franchise, which is Pennsylvania and quite a few other places where they, over many decades, were driven out, starting in Delaware and Maryland at the time of the revolution. 
and a little after. So there's where they did vote and then where they were driven out. In that case, I focus on PA. And then where they lost the vote and got it back. And that's Rhode Island in a very spectacular way. And there's some quite well-known books about that. New York, which was bigger in the pre-war decades, more important electorally even than California's now. So they're getting the vote back by hook or by crook in New York had huge import. And Ohio, which I've already cited, which is the third largest state. So these are my three instances. Um, so I'm gonna start talking about those case studies and get up to Pennsylvania as quickly as possible because I assume that is what would most interest you. But I need to say one proviso at, at the, at the get-go. The United States prior to, no, prior to the 14th Amendment or prior to the Civil War was not a nation state in the way that we talk about it now. Too much sovereignty, real concrete sovereignty resided at the states and most politics in the states and at the level of the states and most politics was done at the level of the states. And it is hard for us to see this. This isn't just some sort of flat statement about the civil war creating a much more powerful national government. The national government was small. It was important, it was crucial. People wanted to control it, but for certain purposes. Um, primarily really, you know, I mean, the central purpose that you people, that people fought over controlling the national government what was achieved was driving out Native Americans and opening up huge territories for slavery. That's the major thing that happens. And from my point of view. So there's a reason to focus on the states, but it also means you have to pay very, very close attention to specific states. And when I see other historians generalizing about the North or the South, I always think, I'm not the only person who says this, you really can't generalize about the North. You have to pay, you can generalize about Upper New England because the political culture there and the legal structures of voting are so similar. But generally, you really have to look state by state. Okay, so um, I'm gonna quickly go through these other cases so I can get to PA. Um, Upper New England, as I've stressed, black men voted there openly. We have you know, eyewitness talk about Prince Hall leading his men to the polls in 1788 in Boston. He's really the first public black political leader, closely allied with the Federalists. Um, here, it's important to note that New England as a whole was, depending on how you count it, um, five, eight, nine times as important politically in the early Republic as it is now. So for instance, um, uh, Vermont, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine had, um, which have had nine times as many members as the House of Representatives in 1810 as it does now. So why am I bringing this up? If black men voted in that region freely and openly over this entire period, it had much greater weight because the region itself had much greater weight than it does now. Places like Vermont and Maine were not cute little byways, quaint tourist zones. They were some of the most dynamic, rapidly expanding parts of the country. And I call Upper New England um, a Yankee Republic. That's my name for it um, uh, because it is a place that is committed to formal juridical non-racialism. I didn't say anti-racialism or anti-racist. I said non-racialism to much like Canada, a place where before the law, people are treated the same. And, uh, you know, as, and the open and avid participation in politics from the 1790s on is some of the best proof of that. Um, so black politics in upper New England and is really concentrated in the port towns, Portland, Salem, Boston, New Bedford, Providence eventually. And um, that's where the black men are concentrated with their very strong presence on, on the whaling ships and, in, uh, and on the docks. They are a concentrated vote and their, uh, their weight is noted often, especially by slave owners in the South. And I think I will simply gesture towards that. If you find this of interest, buy the book. There's a lot there, uh, claims of them swinging congressional races. Uh, and they're, they're mobilized and active. They are not clients or, and their votes 
especially New Bedford, Portland, there's a lot of votes there in, in, in these small but very important cities, keeping in mind that New Bedford um, was the wealthiest place in America at the time. So having a large black electorate, Democrats like to say 800, I don't think it was that big, but it was big, really meant something. So that's upper New England that, as I said, I'm, I'm gesturing towards. This was a, a citadel, a Gibraltar of black political power in certain ways, small but powerful in certain places. New York is really key. Um, black men voted in New York, all around the state, concentrated in what was then New York, as today Manhattan, uh, from the 1790s until their effective, most partial but mostly effective disfranchisement in 1821. And their vote became more and more important because it was cast in a very strategic way. It was a block vote. And you have to get into the mechanics of political power in New York to see how their vote for the New York Assembly delegation in New York County had a really big weight, was seen as a swing statewide in the state that had a, a, just an extraordinary amount of patronage and power in the Electoral College. So they were um, disfranchised by, I think, I argue, um, effectively it was Martin Van Buren who pulled it off, his control of the New York State Constitutional Convention. And he is, you know, a dark figure, shall we say, a real heron vogue Democrat born into a slaveholding family, married into an even bigger slaveholding family, you know, the architect of Jacksonian democracy and all its vaunting racialism. So, but the important thing to remember is they got disfranchised because they were becoming a bigger and bigger block. And people like Van Buren could see how much bigger they would get with the final emancipation at the end of 1827. And my book has charts showing how big their electorate already was and how much bigger it was going to get. So this is quite a story. Now, the second piece of this to wrap up New York is that despite what Van Buren did, because he was embarrassed or it's not, it's hard to say, they put in a huge property requirements only for black men in 1821, a $250 freehold, which is a big farm, not just an ordinary freehold, but a big farm. And yet by the 1850s, a really substantial black electric had come back in and I discussed this in detail. Were these men simply affirming to a sympathetic ju election judge? Yes, I do own that. Had many of them been given deeds to farms? There's the evidence, strong deeds by America's wealthiest man, Garrett Smith, who said he was going to hand out deeds to 3,000 men. I argue that apparently he did, and those men in Manhattan and Brooklyn voted in even larger numbers. It's quite a story. They were, bl they were blamed or cheered repeatedly for swinging statewide elections, 1849 and 1850 gubernatorial elections. Their general claim in the late 1850s was to have 11,000 voters in a state with about 400,000. And they were closely tied with the nation's premier political machine, the William Seward Thurlow Weed machine that came over from the Whigs to the Republicans. Notice, I'm just talking straight up partisan politics because that's the part that historians have not done. So New York's quite something. Now we get up to Ohio. I'm some collapsing, you know, many, many hundreds of pages here. But if you're interested, you'll get the book. Ohio is truly remarkable because it goes up against so many shibboleths that people have about the nature of American racial politics. For generations, we've been told with great sincerity that we have one drop racialism. <clears throat> Not in Ohio. In 1823 and 1831 and repeatedly after, the Ohio State Supreme Court defined whiteness as preponderantly white. So that any man who claimed, and it kind of depended who he was making the claim to, that he was preponderantly white, as if you could tell, could vote had the privileges of whiteness. And these were state Supreme Court decisions. And they really, they were noticed. And there's a great deal of evidence about how that begins to be used more and more and more. So by the 1850s, Democrats who are driven almost hysterical uh, by this fact of this mobilized black electorate, they go into the new Republican party. They have elected leaders the great John Mercer Langston, a huge political figure, um, is an elected leader 
a leader in the Republican Party who stands on party platforms with Governor Salmon P. Chase, who Democrats called a Negro governor, and maybe they use that other word. This is the late 1850s in Ohio, third largest state in the country. There is black political power in Ohio in the 1850s. Um, and it's, so that's where my book culminates and ends. Well, let's go back to Pennsylvania so we can get this done. I'm screen sharing. Now, Pennsylvania, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Pennsylvania boy myself. I grew up in Union County and now I teach in Lancaster. And there are certain things about Pennsylvania that I have to say really shocked me or blew my mind when I studied this because it was like nothing has changed. Um, the extreme localism of our state, it's fractured political culture. Um, you know, even the State Tourist Bureau has us broken down into all those little regions. Um, and so that's something I'm very familiar with. And that has a great deal to do with who votes and who doesn't vote. And believe me, I'm not just talking about Black Pennsylvanians. County by county, for decades and decades from the revolution on, in the one county, they would decide whether the sons of immigrants, the sons of naturalized immigrants could vote, or whether naturalized immigrants could vote, or whether men between 20 and 21 could vote. This just went around for decades. And it represented, you know, something to me that's very Pennsylvanian very, very small scale. And what today, to be blunt, looks like a very backwards political culture in some ways. I don't think it's an accident that we haven't produced any presidents. I think James Buchanan sort of represents us, but this is me speaking very personally. So let's be really clear. They're both of our revolutionary constitutions, 1776, 1790, unequivocally adopt non-racial taxpayer suffrage. Indeed, when Pennsylvania, to its eternal credit, legislated, the first time this had ever happened in human history, legislated emancipation. Yes, gradual emancipation in 1780. The delegates from the slaveholding counties, like Lancaster, argued, if you emancipate them, they're going to be free men and vote. And the majority said, yes, that's right. They'll be free men and they'll vote, like other free men. So it was right there in the 1780 Emancipation Act. So, you know, so here we, we're talking about, and I, I just I gesture in part to honor Franklin and Marshall, the two old classic books about Pennsylvania book. One is called A Game Without Rules, and that definitely gets at, that's Philip Klein, I think. And the other one is The Keystone and the Republican Arch, and that is central. You notice I'm talking about our politics overall, not just what Black men do. The Keystone and the Republican Arch, a famous phrase, a classic book. Pennsylvania was absolutely central to the Jeffersonian Republican Party and then the Democratic Party, which are functionally the same party from the 1790s on, Jeffersonian Republicans. Textbooks call them Democratic Republicans, but that's not what they call themselves. They call themselves Republicans. That party turns into the Democratic Party. That party can win national elections, win the North only with Pennsylvania. It is the keystone in the Republican arch. In this case, capital R Republican. Remember, we're not talking Lincoln's party. Those are mostly ex-Whigs. So now, so now we get down to it. The, the problem of how Pennsylvania's Black voting history has been taught, it has been collapsed into the story of Philadelphia. This happens in every part of the country. It is a problem of historians. Instead of doing Pennsylvania history, they do books on Philly. They do books on Boston instead of New England, on New York City instead of New York State it's it's a problem. Um, in Philadelphia, which was throughout the entire period that I'm describing, never contained a majority of Pennsylvania's African-American population, despite the histories that have been written. The implication is, is that Philadelphia is where most of them are. That's not true. A large numbers of African-Americans all across the state. Philadelphia is obviously the largest group, very important. In Philadelphia, they abstained. Their Federalist allies and friends and patrons in the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, who controlled the city into the 1820s, kept them off the tax rolls. The tax rolls are effectively the voter registration list, but they made no objection at all. That is why they do not vote in Philadelphia. It is a conscious abstention. And this is a, you know, I'm, I'm challenging the other historians who've written about this. I think the evidence is overwhelming. 
when James Fortin says in 1813 in the letters of a man of color, which we celebrate, it's a very important document, anyone who knows Pennsylvania's black history, the key phrase is, we wish not to legislate. Versions of that are repeated over and over by the Philadelphia's leaders until the eight, through the 1830s. And when they are disfranchised, other black Philadelphian leaders say, why did you let this? If only if we'd voted, we could have blocked this. Why did you go along with this? I document that in the book in detail, down to the you know, evidence of them being kept off the tax rolls. But that is not the rest of the state. I, you're, I'm screen sharing. So look at these counties, 1820. Now, these are many of the most populous counties. Uh, Lancaster, Bucks, Dauphin, Allegheny. These are major, major counties where they are voting throughout this period. And we know they're voting because Democrats, racist Democrats talk about it at the 1837 convention, but it's talked about before over decades. There are references, oh, the counties where they vote. So they are voting in significant numbers. Um, and that's really, you know, much of, much of the thrust of what I want to argue is that they are voting in significant numbers. So wrapping this up, um, why, why would they disfranchise? Um, and this is where the kind of history I'm doing is you don't study black men voting in isolation, you put it into the larger frame. The Jeffersonian Republican Democratic Party, which had dominated the state from about 1798 into the 1830s, finally begins to collapse factional feuding and a new party alignment looms. The anti-Masonic party led by Tad Stevens, which has a strong anti-slavery element in Pennsylvania as elsewhere, and the Whig party, a pro-business party, doesn't like the Democrats. They coalesce, they have a coalition. In 1835, they win the governorship with Simon Rittner. And Rittner, and behind him, Tad Stevens, very closely associated, are open abolitionists. There's nothing vague about this, and I, the evidence is there. I mean, open abolitionists, as in sending money to abolition conventions and membership in societies. And when he's elected, Rittner gets up in his inaugural at the beginning of 1836 and says, Pennsylvania should stop bowing its knee to, its, to the dark eye of slavery. So this, the Democrats are, you know, on the ropes. And then the, the Whigs and Andy Masons pass a registry law, which had hardly ever existed, to keep down the Irish vote. The Democrats are enrolling Irish pretty much as soon as they arrive in Philly. So a registry law will cut sharply into Democratic margins. So this sets up, this extreme partisan ferment sets up the 1837-38 convention. What is notable is that the first attempt by Democrats uh, an Irishman from Philadelphia, he, he boasted of being Irish. I'm Irish, so I can say these things. Um, brought in the first attempt to put the white in our state's constitution in the suffrage clause. And he avowed that as far as he was concerned, there should be total unlimited suffrage for white men. Here's the quote, John Cummins. Every white man that lived in Pennsylvania who loved his country and was willing to turn out and hazard his life in defense of its rights in the militia ought to have the right to vote, but no black men. Um, so the first attempt to do this in the late spring of 1837 was went down hard. It was defeated. Um, enough Democrats wouldn't vote for it. The Whigs and the anti Masons were solid. And then a series of things happened. In October 1837, there was an election in Bucks. Bucks was then the sixth largest state in the county in the state. The Whigs carried it by a tiny margin, 3,826. Two, I'm sorry, 3,286 to 3,261, that's 25 votes for county commissioner. And the Democratic newspapers trumpeted, this is a headline, a large body of Negro votes have controlled the late election. And the Democrats use this all over the state. So when the convention comes back together on January 20, 1838, the whole balance has shifted. People don't show up. Whigs who voted for non-racial suffrage and shift their um, margin. But weeks earlier, a Democratic judge and Bucks had already issued an opinion that Black men could not vote because Pennsylvania was founded as, quote, a community of white men exclusively. And then on February 27, 1838, this is a trifecta, the state Supreme Court ruled in the case of William Fogg, who was a prosperous Black farmer in the upper tier of landowners up in Luzerne County, way up there. And Fogg probably, 
every reason to think he'd been voting for a long time, but Democrats had turned him away in 1835, and the case had gone to the state Supreme Court, which again asserted that this was a community of white men. So that's Pennsylvania. It's the last state to disfranchise. These opinions were, in fact, unequivocally, consciously, the forerunners of Dred Scott, of that famous, terrible piece, Judge Tawney's uh, decision about um, what that America was a community of white men. So that's how our history fits into this. And I think that I am, I've done enough. Over to you. Great, thank you so much, Professor Goss. I'm going to change us to um, gallery view here. We already have some questions um, and I will start, I will read them chronologically, uh, beginning with Angela Love's question. Were the black people who voted free or could enslaved people also vote? They were um, definitely free. In early, the earlier instances, many of them may have been formally enslaved, and as so many did, negotiated you know, a five-year contract, that's Bishop Richard Allen, make money on the side, do extra work, and then buy themselves, or they'd run away. But they definitely um, were, were free. Um, interestingly, and you, since you brought it up, in this same period, in the, eight, in the teens, a little over 200 years ago, in New York State, where there were still a much larger body, there are very few enslaved people left in Pennsylvania after 1800. They bought their way out and pushed through. There's some, and there's some, you know, definitely indentured younger people. But in New York State, there are constant charges by Republicans that, you know, enslaved men are voting. This is how they whip it up um, in New York, but not in Pennsylvania. Thank you. And Jasmine Noel Yarish, and I hope I am pronouncing your last name correctly, Jasmine, asks, it seems as if you are operationalizing the concept of reconstruction through voting. However, that was not the only politically significant institution that was at the heart of the reconstruction project. We could also think about the creation of the public school. Can you please define what you mean by reconstruction? Is your definition of reconstruction different from that of critical black historians like W.E.B. Du Bois, from which, of course, is who Foner took his definition of reconstruction? Yes. Um, well, I mean, using, you know, the first reconstruction was not my original title for the book, but it, and it's a polemical title, I admit it. Actually, I was just uh, two days ago was teaching Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. Um, as, as, you know, a, a unique, a, a great work of scholarship that is also emphatically, in a certain sense, a primary document. Uh, little noticed when people talk about it is that Du Bois goes through all of the, the places where Black men, free Black men, could vote in the early Republic. He knew this history and he talks about it. But I don't want to evade your question. Um, of course, radical Reconstruction after the Civil War had a, a whole range of community institution building, of establishing economic independence as much as possible, of gaining public schools. Um, but all of those, all of those are less significant, I would argue, than enfranchisement and what en enfranchisement should bring, which is the protection of the state than any citizen should have. The core the fundamental principle of citizenship is the security of the body. Now, if I say this in the time that we're living in, it raises questions about, you know, actual, is there real citizenship now if you are not secure in your body? Ask Armand Aubrey if he was secure, right? If you can still be, do I need to say more? But I do think voting is the sine qua non of citizenship in the period that I'm describing. And it's not simply, it's not me who says that, it's all of, you know, an, an, an enormous body of black men who say that, um, that this is the thing that would make them equal citizens, which is why the abstention of the Philadelphians is actually, uh, needs to be acknowledged that they, they chose something less than full citizenship. So I do think that radical reconstruction revolves on that, and that is Foner's argument, and it is Du Bois's argument that disfranchisement 
1890 on, or before through white terror, is the crux of the destruction of Reconstruction. So that's my take. Um, and this next question sort of touches on what you what you just mentioned briefly um, about Philadelphia. Stephen Alderman asks, why didn't Black people vote in Philly? Well, I mean, I, I, I go all through it. You know, it's, we don't, we don't have access to letters. It's a, I think that Richard Newman's book on the Pennsylvania Abolition Society is pretty key. And it's not just that, it's, it's the structure of Philadelphia federalism, that German historian whose name, it's hard to pronounce, Hoxnick or something like that, cultural federalism. Um, it appears to me, you know, and, I'm, and of course I'm relying on Julie Winch. I mean, nobody could begin to talk about Black Philadelphia without her foundational work, including Gentlemen of Color, but actually the earlier book on the Black elite. I think that there is a very tight fit between the elite of our people, as Samuel Cornish called them, and the Federalist anti-slavery elite, Thomas Earle, who are not to be, you know, these are very powerful people. This is the cream of the bar of the American bar, not just the Philadelphia bar. And as Richard Newman documents, and of course I use his stuff, they are providing a great deal of really consequential protection in the most fundamental sense to this community, which is on, the, on a borderland with, with slavery. And that is the difference between upper New England or New York. Black Philadelphia is full of people who have just gotten away from Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and the, and the protection is urgently needed. And of course, this really comes to the fore in the 1820s when the last Federalist mayor, you know, goes pretty far, does everything he can think of to do to try to stop the kidnapping of black children in Philadelphia. That's a real story that some of you know. Under those circumstances, and I'm trying not to be presentist, let alone arrogant, I think that that kind of protection mattered more to that community than, than the right to vote. Now, at some points, you know, I mean, I, I, I tell the story of the attempt by Bishop Allen's son, I believe, or was it Fortin's son, several of the young men born into the most elite families to found a fire company. There is nothing more crucial to Philadelphia society in the early 19th century than the fire companies. And there is a, a whole campaign, a suggestion that the Federalist mayor, I forget his name, he was mayor about 10 times, over and over and over and over, was mayor of Philadelphia over decades, that this is a little political deal that he allowed them. Wharton, that's his name. But what's disturbing is, is that the, the fathers of these men, Fortin and others, obviously I admire James Fortin, come in really hard and fast in 1819 and say, no, 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 we'll, none of that. We'll, we won't do that. They form you know, a committee and suppress. So I think it's a complicated political arrangement involving protection. But I mean, the evidence is there. You know, it's in their memorials to the Pennsylvania legislature. We are, we, the phrase citizens for protection, we ask only to be citizens for protection. That's in a memorial from the entire Philadelphia, Philadelphia elite in 1831 because they're being threatened with pass laws like South Africa. So I understand why they chose not to vote, but the consequences, you know, I mean, are quite serious because they had a big vote. They could have had a big vote. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Professor Goss. Um, our next comment slash question comes from Dee Andrews. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Professor Goss. This right. is such important work. Since you raised current political issues, I'll ask about another problem. My question, doesn't the widening out of black political history also provide ammunition for the political right today, especially in claims, of, in claims that the US was founded as a white country among many other similar misunderstandings about the antebellum US? Well, I, I agree with you. I think that this, I mean, you know, we, we've, we've learned this term, white nationalism. I think it is bred extremely deeply, the idea that some people are real Americans and others are not. I mean, Sarah Palin on the stump when she went rogue in late, you know, September 2008, the real Americans. So there's a part of me that, you know, um, 
The original title for my book was We Are Americans, because there is no phrase that comes is repeated more often from the great mass meeting in Philadelphia in 1817 to repudiate colonization over and over and over. We are Americans. And I think that, you know, the political import my, of my book is to say, yeah, they were. I mean, James Fortin, you know, was a revolutionary, a prisoner and a hero of the Revolutionary War. Um, I'm only bringing up Fortin because he's such an important figure for anyone concerned with Pennsylvania history. Um, so, you know, that to me is, uh, I guess I take it personally. We are Americans. I, I have my own idea who's an American, and I don't like someone else coming along and saying, no, 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 I, you know, uh, over here. But I'm going to say one more thing about this, if I may, Dee, because I remember us meeting at the McNeil Center uh, when I gave my paper some years ago. I think we met. Um, I haven't talked about this. In my first chapter on Black Republicanism, it is worth noting that to an extraordinary degree, the Black men that I write about and their white allies focus, use the word. This goes back to Franklin back in 1761. They do not use the word race or color. They use the word complexion. They insist, and this goes against virtually everything that any of us have in our heads, I think. They insist that phenotype is a matter of complexion. And complexion, of course, is quite different than color. It is more mutable. So that is actually, I think, the understanding of, and let me see, not to prolong this too long, but uh, let me put up a picture. So here is, you know, one of the great figures of Black Pennsylvania history, Robert Purvis. Robert Purvis, you know, was, was a gentleman's son and extremely wealthy. And he had every opportunity to pursue the advantages of complexion, and he refused. He told anyone, everyone, that he was a man of color. If you don't know who Robert Purvis is, then wiki him. This is a very major figure, driven out of Philadelphia, almost burned out of his house in 1842 in the race riots. Of 1842 goes up to Bucks, where he's the biggest taxpayer in his township. So anyway, the kind of person the Democrats like to inveigh against, like he's going to, he's going to be on the jury soon. He's going to be deciding elections. So um, complexion—that's the word that someone like Purvis or Fortin or Bishop Allen—they that's the word they would use, which is a different understanding of what it means to be an American. More, uh, more open more rooted in personal characteristics. So did I do any of my research? Yes, I did some, there was, I'd have to go and dig it out. I think I found the, um, I think I found the, the donation book of the Philadelphia chapter of the Washington Benevolence Society from 1814, 15, 16, documenting that James Fortin and several other black leaders had been major donors. The Washington Benevolence Society is basically the 501c3 organization of the Federalist Party, okay? If you follow me, it is a Federalist organ. And even though they weren't voting, Fortin and several other black leaders were major donors to the WPS. And I thought that was an indication of their of their partisan affiliation. So the LCP was very useful for me, if I may use that acronym. Um, oh my God, your sister, Ellen Schrecker? Ellen's a very close friend. Uh, yes. Bertram Wolf. To clarify, yes. in case anyone isn't seeing, um, Professor Goss is referring to Mary Herdig's comment um, in the chat asking if Professor Goss had done any research at the library company. And Mary mentioned that um, Ellen Schrecker is um, her sister. Yes, Ellen Schrecker is, is a, a one of the great historians of our time, the preeminent historian of McCarthyism and a proud Philadelphian, as far as I know, but a very close friend of mine. So other these are great questions. Um, we have a few yeah. more. Okay. Um, one other question. Uh, much of your earlier research is focused on the 20th century. What mm -hmm. prompted a change to an earlier time period? And what similarities did you notice among the disenfranchised people of these two times, specifically in the methods used to suppress them? Well, that's a hell of a question. When I look back on my career, virtually everything that I've done has been sort of I haven't sat down and planned to do it. I've been led into it by finding some evidence, which I think is 
is, I'm, I think it's a good way to go. So my dissertation and first book, Where the Boys Are, Cuba, Cold War America, and the Making of a New Left, long title. But Where the Boys Are is the main title. I, I didn't set out to write that. I was going to do something else. And I was led into it by the evidence. And I discovered it's about roughly 1956, 62, the reception of the Cuban Revolution, how, how Americans engage with it. And to my complete surprise, I was not trained in, in African-American history, though I did study with David Levering Lewis. I discovered there was this very strong current of Black solidarity with the Cuban Revolution, and indeed that that had persisted for decades. And then that book, this is the true story. It got a, it got a much more favorable response from black historians than from others, shall we say. And I was invited to write articles. So I was invited to write an article about the extraordinary black intellectual, Harold Cruz, the author of The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. And I interviewed Mr. Cruz. And so you see one thing leads to another. And somewhere there, circa about 1996, 97, I got this idea based on studying the roots of black power, Mr. Harold Cruz, 1950s, I thought, my God, there's a whole story here of Black political engagement that has not been told. Going back to the end of Reconstruction, I kept seeing things about how African Americans had been politically active in the Republican Party, in the Communist Party, things like that. So I, I, I conceived of a big book and did all this research for about eight years. It was going to be called Black Power in White America. A lot of research a lot of interviews. It was going to start in 1877. I started writing the book around 2004. And by that time, I had begun to find little bits of evidence that Black men had been voting before the Civil War, which made no sense to me. What? How? That couldn't. But there was just a little bit here and there. And I thought, well, I better go chase that down because it seems like there was something before Reconstruction. Well, that's all she wrote. I started chasing it down and one thing led to another, you know, Scholarship led me to primary sources. This is what we do. So um, it, it felt like a story that needed to be told, basically. Thank you for asking. Thank you. That was a, a beautiful answer. Um, we have a follow-up question from Jasmine Noel Yarish, um, who asks, how does the historiography of reconstruction as developed by the Dunning School play in your analysis? Well, I mean, thank God, I, I'm just old enough, I'm 64, to have been born into a, a time when you were taught, I mean, I was a little history geek up in a Pennsylvania public school in a small college town, and I studied everything there was about the Civil War, not absolutely no idea that there were Black soldiers playing a central role in the Civil War. You know, it was all white, 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 and those pictures of black, you know, sorry, not black, um, Union and Confederate soldiers shaking hands in 1939 at Gettysburg. Like so many generations of Pennsylvania kids, I went to Gettysburg. This is white history. So I don't know how that relates to the Dunning School, but and slavery, we were taught almost nothing about slavery. Black people were sort of an inert presence, really, you know, so I remember that. And I actually remember even in the 70s, in the early 70s, being at a progressive private school in New York, and I was still being taught that the Civil War was essentially an economic conflict, the Charles Beard analysis, you know, the, the capitalist North versus the agrarian South. And Reconstruction was like this sort of, all I remembered, I have a very good memory, historians have good memories generally. All I learned about Reconstruction was the disastrous attempt to impeach Andrew Johnson. So I've lived through what it means to white out, of which the Dunning School was just one part, right? To white out the presence of so many Americans in our history. So it, you know, it gives us, it gives you a certain impetus to actually learn what's been left out. That's that's my best shot. You just got another question. If you don't mind taking one final question. Um, no. Um, Arthur Sudler, who asks, how does the activism of Octavius Cato fit into the earlier model of Black voting in Pennsylvania? That's a great question, because, you know, that scholarship on Octavius Cato. Um, 
Well, you know, I've got these two chapters on Pennsylvania, and the first one is really about the so-called shadow politics of Philadelphia. I'm frankly dubious about the shadow politics thesis because I, I think, it, you know, and I quote people who write about it, it rests on the flat assertion that black men could not vote. And I said, well, if actually they could have voted and they were voting up in bucks, then the shadow politics thing doesn't work so well, okay? How does how, what, how, connect to your question? It's not me, okay? It's black leaders from everywhere else in the North who talk about Philadelphia in the late 1840s and 50s as a shameful place. Almost all of the very impressive black churches bar any discussion of black abolitionism, of abolitionism, not black abolitionism. Only one will let Frederick Douglass speak. This is, you know, well known, talked about. It's considered a problem. Uh, and I have lots of, I mean, it's all there. It's primary sources and it's, it's you know, black men from Elbury else in the North saying, what is wrong with Pennsylvania, especially Philadelphia? I, despite some historians, I think if you look closely, what you see in Philadelphia, this is in that famous notorious book from 1841, Sketches of Colored Life, whatever that book, what you see is a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings, a lot of feuding and fighting, not a lot of protest, except from the more mobilized working class. Something is happening there, though, and I try to get down into it. There's some, it's a very, it's, it's hard to get at what that world is in the late 1850s, but something is there. So I'm trying, I'm doing my best to answer your question. One of the, one of the most interesting comments is by Mifflin Gibbs, one of the great radical, black radical abolitionists, as is a judge in Arkansas. He's a young man growing up in Philadelphia, 1840s and 50s, a judge in Arkansas, then United States consul at, I believe, Madagascar, a real post-Civil War antebellum political figure, Mifflin Gibbs. And when he, how he describes the world he grew up in is it's pretty grim. Somehow, Octavius Cato, who I do not, or Cato, I, who I do not know that much about, I've just read the same articles of you, he is part of what is clearly a re-articulation, re a refounding. Now, so I'll be honest, when I say my book is 1790, 1860, I really mean it. Like I don't, 1860, I do not go beyond that. But it seems fairly clear that the experience of recruiting for the United States colored troops, the experience of fighting is, I mean, the, the, the epilogue to my book says that this changes everything. And I'm not the only person to say that. The entire structure of black politics to 1860 is just blown up by this huge war. I as far as I can tell, right, a majority of Northern free black men go fight, a majority. They fight in a much larger number proportionally than white men. Well, that, that, that itself, and they die. So I assume that he's coming out of that, a much more militant perspective than had existed in the 1850s. That's my best shot. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for attending tonight. We are so glad you were able to join us. Um, thank you again to Professor Goss for sharing your, your research with us and reporting out. Um, you, can, you can purchase the book to, to read more about these case studies. Um, and if you are in Philadelphia, we hope to, to see you at our exhibitions. Um, we will be holding a fireside chat every third Thursday throughout the rest of 2022. So, so stay tuned, check our website, and we hope everyone has a wonderful evening.